Hi, I'm Kurt Mitchell. Welcome to the Beatle Guitar Method. We have a lot to cover, so let's get straight to tuning our guitars. If you have a tuner, I'm tuned to A440. You could go ahead and tune to your tuner and we'll be in tune. If not, I'm going to give you a pitch to tune to, then you tune your guitar and we'll be all set, okay? <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about the gear that we're using, since there are so many different sounds in the Beatles' uh, guitar approach. I mean, a lot, thousands of them, seems like. Um, and as time goes by, they got heavier and more distorted. Um, we're going to just kind of stick to the same equipment. I'm going to play a Stratocaster, and I'm going to play my acoustic guitar, and uh, we're going to cover the whole tape that way. Um, as we go on, though, I have some older stomp boxes and some uh, fuzz boxes and stuff that I'll show you. I mean, it depends on how realistic realistically you want to um, reproduce this stuff. If you want to play along to it, you just play and we'll play. If you want to reproduce it, they had Vox amps and all kinds of stuff going on, so, and multi-tracking, and, uh, and usually that's not available to everybody. So we're just going to um, get on with it. We'll get to riff one in a second, and as we proceed through the video, I'll show you what I'm using to get certain sounds. This is just a basic clean sound with nothing on it, and we're strumming at it, okay? Here we go. This is riff number one. again. Um, we switched guitars here. We'll be switching back and forth between this one and my Strat, like I said. Um, for the acoustic stuff, I wanted to play an acoustic guitar for you so you could see what it sounded like. This is riff number six, and uh, they're strumming on this one. Um, any old acoustic will do. I happen to have a really neat old Martin here, but anyone will do. Here we go. This is riff number six, okay? Okay, we're back to the Strat now, and uh, we'll be switching back and forth periodically as the video goes on, like I said. Um, this is a little bit of the lead from that same song we were just doing, okay? This is Riff 7. Here we go.
Here's Rafiq. <laughs> Once again. Once again. Once again. Okay, we're back on the acoustic here. Um, this is an excerpt from the song yesterday. Uh, what he's doing is Paul used to pick with uh, two fingers. There's a couple finger picking things coming up that I'll show you more in depth. But Paul, it seemed to me, used to only pick with his two fingers when he finger picked. Um, so I'll show you this, and he's strumming this with his fingers, all right? And from down, up, 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 up. All right, here we go. This is riff number 12. <laughs> We're back to the Strat again, and uh, as time progressed, and we did these pretty much in chronological order, um, they started getting a little more distorted, and they, over in Europe, uh, or in London actually, Eric Clapton's coming out, and they're getting into Marshalls and Les Pauls, and they're getting a certain sort of sound that became a hard rock guitar sound. Um, and they started using different things to get distortion. Um, later on, we'll, I'll show you some of the distortion pedals. I have a real old one and a newer one, and they sound way different. And, uh, but basically, this sound is just like plugged straight into one of those Marshall Combo Amp sounding things. Or they used to use Voxes too. Plugged straight in and it's barely distorted and you got to play it real hard. And if you're playing a Stratocaster, like I am, and you have that horribly thin sound when you go to the back pickup, get heavier strings. These are 11s. And the heavier the string, the more sound gets through the guitar 
and the heavier it sounds, and it makes the Strat sound cool. Play a Strat with nines, and you can't get it to sound good. So uh, let's go to riff 13. Here we go. Once again. Riff 14. Once again. Riff 15. Once again. Riff 16. Once again. It's about time, I guess, we start talking about some of this distortion uh, and the things they were using, like I told you we were going to. Uh, this is an excerpt from Day Tripper, and it's got this real nasally. They used to use this back pickup a lot, the Beatles. Um, it's got a real thin sort of sort of sound, and they didn't have the really neat distortion pedals that they got out now that are structured so that when, they, when you step on them, everything sounds like a big stack of Marshalls. Uh, they were just starting out, you know, building these things. and. Um, they were using stuff like this. My grandfather gave, gave me this thing when I was like 15 years old. And uh, it's an Olsen Fuzzmaster, and on the box it was like $12. And if you check it out, it uh, runs on a flashlight battery, <laughs> and not, not a 9-volt, and it runs, and it, they won't even let you use your own cable to plug it in. You've got to use their cable. But uh, this thing has the sound, man. It's got that old, grungy, yucky sound, and the new ones don't. They sound like Marshalls. So anyways, let's get to it. This is riff number 18. Once again. Riff 19. Once again. Riff 20. Once again. Twenty-two. Once again.
Uh, here on riff 23, uh, we took a bit of the solo riffs, and uh, he punched this in. I'm almost positive of it, because at the end, he breaks into a slide thing. So what I've done, usually I wear my slide on my ring finger, uh, is I've put it on my pinky finger so I can play the riffs. It's kind of handy. So I'm playing the riffs, and then at the end, I can just use the slide. Um, so if you're playing slide and you need your fingers at any time, this is the way you can do it. This is riff 23. Here we go. <laughs> Once again. Um, on this uh, riff, this riff 24, they're uh, playing a strum thing and they've got a capo on the, on the neck. And these things are great. What they do is allow you to play up the neck. It's like moving the nut up the neck or shortening the guitar. Um, and this one's pretty high with respect to the way people usually use them. This is on the seventh fret. All the way across the seventh fret, you got a capo. Okay? And this one's kind of cool and it's, uh, it's a little trigger thing that uh, all you got to do is put it on there. And the thing about capos is if you move them towards the fret, you won't have to retune your guitar too much because what happens is you're usually not in tune and you got to go retune your guitar a little bit. You move the more, the closer to the fret you put it, the closer to the fulcrum and this and that, and it, it will play in tune. But what happens is um, if you do that, you can't, it's like there's something in your way when you go to play open strings. So, I mean, it's up to you. What I usually do is put it close to the fret so I don't got to mess around. Um, let's get on with this. This is Riff 24. One more thing before we move on. Uh, if you don't have a capo, you can use a pencil and rubber bands because um, if you're, you're probably sitting here watching the tape and you're having a good time, man, and you don't have a capo. So you can take a pencil and a couple of rubber bands and put the pencil across the net or, or the fret that you want and put the rubber bands around it, put them around the other side and wind them around a couple times and you got a capo. And it works real well. So let's press on, shall we? <laughs> Once again. Riff 26. Once again. Seven. Once again.
This is Riff 28. We're back to our acoustic guitar, and uh, this is sort of an Italian-sounding pizza-eating kind of a thing. But it's done, in, I think it's done on a ukulele or a mandolin, probably a ukulele. I'm going to show you how to do it on an acoustic guitar, okay? Riff 28, here we go. Here's Rift 29. Once again. Rift 30. Once again. Rip 32. What we're going to do here is I'm going to show you a couple, a couple of new things. We've got a real clean sound. We've got our rear pickups going still, that really nasally sound, and a little bit of chorus and uh, a D tune. In other words, you take your, D, your E string, your low E string, which is usually here, and tune it down to D. And you'll get a whole chord sound like, sound like that, okay? And then you want to... The thing about it is that you want to remember is you want to accent a couple of different notes. It's uh, for me, it's easier to do it with my fingers. You want to accent these notes. Right? Um, but you can also do it with a pick. Check this out. If you just take your ring finger and your pick, you pick the first note of the phrase and pluck the top string. doesn't have the same phrasing to it, but for those of you who don't like to finger pick, it's an alternative. Okay? Let's do it then. Riff 32. Once again. Again. Um, a couple more things about that particular riff. It's pretty difficult to play because you have to curl your fingers up real tight and let all the notes remain open as you play it. And the, and the, and the strum, because you can play all kinds of things with that strum, is the bass note starting with an A. Okay, 
and then you put notes in between them. It's, kind of, it's like a country riff. All right, let's move on. Um, this is the uh, intro to Bungalow Bill. And I tell you what, I don't know that uh, any of the Beatles are playing this because it's kind of terrifyingly Al Demiola style fast. And uh, <laughs> I just don't know if they could play like this. But uh, if, you, if you work it up slowly and, and work your way into it, it's not all that hard to play. And it's kind of cool. So here we go. This is riff number 34. Six. Rip thirty seven. Once again. On riff 39 here, uh, we got the same finger pick going that I showed you previously, and uh, I'm using this phase 100 to give it this this phasey sound. Now the difference between these old stomp boxes and the new thing, the new rack mount stuff is that these were designed for a guitar and designed to do one thing, um, and the new gear you buy today, most of it has, it'll do two, three, four things, and uh, it sounds good, but it doesn't sound like this. So if you're wondering why your machines don't sound like this, it's because it's not one of these. Um, so if you want to reproduce these kinds of sound, these are the things you got to go fishing for, and they're real cool to have um, if, if you like these kinds of sounds. Anyway, this is riff uh, 39. Let's get to it. Riff 41 here, I'm going to show you uh, one of Paul McCartney's strums. He's used, he uses a two-finger strum on a lot of stuff. He does one I'll show you a little later, too. Um, this is, uh, I'm going to show you just a strum right here for a second, and, uh, and then I'll show you the riff, okay? This is Riff 41. It's just a strum, and you can, like I said, you play the strum, play other chords around it and stuff, okay? Here's Riff 41. Forty-two. 
Here's riff number 43. This is the rest of the phrase. Okay, here we go. Here's rip 46, fast and slow, uh, got a pick, got a little strum going, and it's kind of neat. Here we go. Trip number 47, we're back to our electric guitar and a bit of distortion, and uh, we're off. Here we go. Slower. Once again. again.
52. Here's Rip 54. This is our last. Uh, this is our last uh, song to pick apart here. Um, here's Rip 54. Okay, we got our acoustic guitar out again. Here we go. Okay, um, that's about it for the, the riffs. Uh, let me summarize. I want to summarize this whole thing. The reason we take these little bits of songs and show them to you is because um, we want to give you an overview of the Beatles' insight and the way they approached their guitar playing. They weren't really thought of as a guitar band. Um, not at least in my mind. They were a songwriting band, which is usually the way to go if you're going to be if you're going to sell some records. You need the songs to stand out. Um, but in doing so, they used guitars as their vehicle to get these songs done. Now, um, the way they, the, I mean, I want you to take something away from this more than a couple of riffs in your hand, you know. I want you to try to, I mean, if you're going to write your own songs, you can have some fun with these kinds of things, and this is a way to build your own songwriting abilities. Um, we had some, just to sum up, we had some finger picking going on, and uh, we had basically two riffs that we were doing. And the one was the uh, thing with the thumb going up and down. The other one was the strum with the two fingers, right? Um, the next tool that they used, they had in their little grab bag of things to get songs out of them with, was uh, the strumming patterns with the pick, right? Mm -hmm. um, they had some 12-8 stuff, and they had, I mean, they, they basically got their ideas out, and my view on strumming was, uh, is that it's more like a drum or a percussive thing, so I mean, they were doing... And there's other stuff go that goes along with that. Um, and um, their chord phrases were, as they evolved, I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot to the Beatles guitar-wise because when they started out playing, it wasn't anything like what they ended up playing. You know what I mean? And uh, they ran the gamut from, from nice little country backwoods tunes to the heaviest, Helter Skelter's a mess, you know? Um, so their phrases and the way they phrased, it depends on who you're talking about, Paul McCartney, had a little more pop orientation to his thing. And when they stopped writing songs together, him and Lennon, and Lennon wanted to play the blues, man. You know, so 
it depends on who you talk about, but basically, it seemed to me like they got a riff in their hands and they got some words to it, and, uh, and that's how they phrased their chords. Um, the tunings, we used uh, the D tuning, and that's about I th all I think the Beatles headed for when they started tuning the guitars. All they did was drop the D down, drop the E down to a D, and that gives you just a big D chord, and a lot of people do that. Um, a lot of people do that. It's a neat tool. Um, now, when you go to play solos, um, the way I play solos, and as the Beatles weren't really the whippinest guitar players in the world. Like I said, they were known more for their songwriting. Um, there's a couple of examples in the tablature. I'll give you a couple examples of uh, how to visualize a fretboard. Instead of copying riffs all the time, there are places to put your fingers where the keys are. Say we're in A. And if you put your hand right here on the fifth fret and bar this, you have these pentatonic patterns. Right? And if you really want to get kind of wild and crazy, you have uh, a, a pattern like this. But what, uh, what struck me about the Beatles was they thought about melodies, and then that kind of stuff doesn't matter, because if you can hear it in your head and translate it to your neck, it doesn't matter. You just got to get your fingers in the right place. But there's a couple of them for you to go ahead and practice solos on anyways. Most of the, most of the soloing stuff was blues-oriented. So uh, they're... Uh, their composition and their arrangements of their songs. When I made my album, it was a, a collaboration. And they had that producer, I, his name escapes me right now, but they had a producer. They had all the time in the world in the studio that they ever, ever wanted. Um, Sergeant Pepper's was done on four tracks. You know, everybody in the world has an eight track recording deck now, it seems like. Um, and it took time, they had the time, and so uh, it seemed to me like when they were, uh, as it evolved, when they started, man, they were pop songs for young girls, and they were a very formulated thing. They went from verses to choruses and solos and out. Uh, and as they evolved and got more eclectic and bizarre, um, they used to just mess around with different sounds, and Paul was always dragging trumpets in for um, any kind of sound he could get his hands on, because he could. Uh, so. So the arrangement, it depends on when you're talking about if they were writing pop songs in, their, in the beginning or if they were making the White Album, you know? But uh, basically their arrangements ran the game. It didn't matter. Whatever sounded good went on tape. Um, and after this, there's a, uh, there's a track that we played in the beginning. There's a tablature to it and you can play along with it. And it, it runs that thing that they used to use that theme a lot. That uh, descending note theme that... So that's, the, that's what I built that thing on, and there's some melody lines in there that resemble... There's a few songs that sound a lot like each other from those guys where they use that, so that's why I picked on that particular uh, uh, chord progression. And um, have fun, and try not to play until your hand hurts, and I hope you had a good time, because we had a good time making it. Until next time, I'll see you later. <laughs>